Okay, so our next presentation is uh, North Carolina's new statewide road centerline data. And uh, presenting today, we have uh, Aaron Lesh, is a, who is a supervisor for the data conversion group with the NCDOT GIS unit. She has 15 years of experience in the GIS industry, is a graduate of both uh, Towson State University and the University of Maryland. And also, we have Tim Sheldon, who's a graduate of both Western Carolina and Appalachian State University. Uh, and he currently works with the Timmons Group and is a GIS business analyst specializing in GIS for state DOTs with a fo focus on business analytics and linear referencing systems. Okay. All right, well, good morning, everyone. Uh, like you said, my name's Aaron, and I oversee the group of people at the North Carolina Department of Transportation who are responsible for maintaining our centerline and linear referencing system. It's actually a role that Tim used to have, and he now supports us as a consultant um, and, and subject matter expert in this area. So we're here to talk about North Carolina's new statewide road centerline data. Um, we're not announcing a new centerline products. North Carolina's had a centerline for many years, and we work very hard to um, update that data, update the accuracy, update the accessibility of that data. So what we're really here presenting on is what's new, what's been updated with that center line that has been around for well over a decade. So where we are is the data is statewide. So the data spans across the entire state. The data is also seamless. Um, it's edge matched at jurisdictional boundaries within the state. It's also topological in that where it's edge matched, those lines are snapped together so you don't have overshoots and dangles. The data is also based on authoritative data. So um, the Department of Transportation would be responsible for what we call system roads and the local government jurisdictions would be responsible for what we call non-system roads. Uh, prior to 2015, the center line, the statewide center line, was comprised of only system roads. And so we've got classifications broken out by interstates, U.S. routes, routes, secondary roads. Um, from the graphic, uh, I think they both kind of look the same, but you see a lot of pink, and that's because the majority of roads in our state are secondary roads, and the pink is representing secondary roads. And then after 2015, we incorporated a new class of roads called non-system roads. And so what we did was collect the data sets from every county or municipality that is maintaining center lines, and we incorporated any other roads that they had beyond what the DOT was already maintaining. And they all got kind of combined into this new class called non-system roads. So the majority of those roads are municipal, municipality-maintained roads, there are some private roads. And then we have found throughout the state several other pieces, features of geometry, of linear, of linear geometry that some jurisdictions are maintaining in their road centerline data set. And so that's also incorporated in our non-system roads now. So here's some examples. Um, driveways, parking lots, shopping center, cut-throughs or drive-throughs. Um, they're probably in there because that jurisdiction needs it for their own 911 uh, reporting. So here is a quick snapshot, a subset of our data just for Wake County, showing what it looked like before 2015 and then after 2015 when we added in all those non-system roads. So the before 2015, hopefully you can see there's a lot more white space in between the line work. After 2015, when we added those non-system roads, now there's a much more dense road network. Um, the non-system roads are represented in like a light green. I think it looks better on this screen than that screen. So to give you an idea of the extent to which our data set has grown, we've jumped from about 76,000 routes, system routes, to now a total of 356,000 routes. Um, I just want to note that uh, that number may or may not seem high or low to you. A route does not equal a centerline segment. So one route is made up of many centerline segments. 
We've also grown from about 96,000 miles of GIS line work that we maintain. This is just strictly talking about maintenance of GIS line work to now a total of 158,000 miles of, of line work. So there's a lot of data, a lot of centerline data. This data set has grown. Um, there is a little caveat at the bottom there. These numbers do include co-routes. So for us, a co-route is where you have two or more routes representing the same piece of pavement. Um, an example might be uh, like around Durham. If you're driving on the highway, you'll see an interstate sign for I-85 and also an interstate sign for I-40. So those are two different routes represented as two different pieces of, of GIS geometry, but they're tied to the same piece of pavement underneath. So if we, if we took out co-routes, these numbers would be a little bit less. We also maintain a whole bunch of attributes. Um, right now, there's over 60. This number is growing as we start working with other attribute data owners. Um, some examples of attributes that we thought people outside of a DOT might be interested in are listed up here. So street name, speed limit, functional class, travel direction, number of lanes, turn lanes, pavement information. Um, we have an entire uh, data dictionary that you can download from our website and we'll provide that URL at the end of the presentation. So I think now I'm going to turn it over. Tim's going to talk about the next couple slides and then pass it back to me to finish out. Thanks, Aaron. Uh, again, my name is Tim Sheldon. I'm with the Timmons Group, uh, supporting in CDOT. So I want to talk to you real quick uh, a little bit more about how the data was construct constructed for this, uh, this newer data set. Um, <clears throat> so originally, Esri was hired to do the, uh, the Rome project, which was the implementation of their Roads and Highways, LRS. Um, and a big component of that was building out this new data set. Uh, it was a multi-phase process, uh, just some high-level bullets here. Um, so as Aaron mentioned earlier, the uh, data were collected from all authoritative sources. Uh, so meaning if, uh, if a road was NCDOT maintained, that's the geometry that was used. used. Uh, if it was a non-system road, meaning NCDOT didn't maintain it, uh, the geometry from the local government, the local agency that maintained it, was used as the, as the source. Uh, so from there, there was an analysis of common attributes. Uh, so when you start looking at all these different data sets, you start to find similarities, and if you see attributes that everyone's using, those are obviously the important ones. So those are the ones that ended up eventually being migrated uh, into... Uh, this newer data set. Uh, there was a new state schema uh, was required, um, and that was uh, mostly to support the new LRS uh, data model that uh, DOT went to. Uh, so a little bit deeper, now that we have all of these different data sets from all these different places, um, there were ETLs written. So if you're not familiar, uh, ETL is Extract, Translate, and Load. Um, so that's a tool that's used to take data from one geometry and one schema and put it in a completely different uh, format. Um, so as we built, like I said, 100 of these ETLs, uh, the intent was to use them uh, for the initial data load and then if needed, DOT can also use them for ongoing maintenance of this uh, data set. Uh, I think one of the, 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 biggest, the biggest parts of this and, and definitely the hardest to QC was the conflation. Um, so when I say conflation, uh, just because NCDOT maintains a center line doesn't mean a local government doesn't also maintain a center line in the same location. Uh, in, in a ton of cases, the local government has information that NCDOT would want about that same piece of center line. So the conflation effort basically takes those attributes from the non-system data and applies them to the system data, which gets them into the new data model uh, so everybody can use them. Uh, the last thing is uh, edge matching. So there's a couple of cases for edge matching. Uh, anywhere where uh, a piece of pavement is longer than one jurisdiction maintains, or one entity, excuse me, so uh, say NCDOT maintains three, maintains three quarters of the length of a road and a local government maintains the, the last piece, um, because those are two separate groups, those, those pieces of geometry don't necessarily match up. Um, so part of the project was to go through and 
snap all of those, uh, those endpoints together. Uh, the second case of edge matching would be <clears throat> where you go from one county to another county on a non-system road. Um, so a county obviously is typically focused on their data, not necessarily their neighbor's data. Uh, so where, you, where, you're, where a non-system road crosses a county line, those two lines are probably not going to be snapped to each other and are probably not going to be snapped to a county boundary. So that's kind of a, a double effort there to make sure the lines break at the boundary and uh, snap to each other. So put this up, everybody can read it, take notes. There's a test on all of this information later. Um, not as funny as I think I am sometimes. Uh, so the, the intent of showing this is, it's actually a pretty simple data model that, uh, that they migrated to. It just has a lot of attributes in it. Um, that's the takeaway from, from the mess. Uh, so what this boils down to is published products that, that everybody can download and use. Um, there are three core products uh, in order of least granularity to most. Uh, the NC routes data is um, a network of routes, but not a routable network, if you will, of, uh, of line data. Um, so this will be line work that's broken every time a route changes, every time a route uh, identifier changes. Uh, a little bit more granular than that is the NC routes arcs, and this is basically the same data set with a little bit more attribution, and it's going to be segmented every time there's an intersecting road, so a little bit more granular. And then there's road characteristics, um, which I'm not sure if anybody's seen, but there are several hundred thousand records in that table. Um, that data is segmented every time any attribute that's captured in the data model changes along the roadway. So you end up with... Uh, a phenomenal amount of tiny little segments, but there's a lot of information there. There's a lot of attributes there for you. LR what? So all of these data we've been talking about are maintained in LRS. Um, I'll try and go through this uh, kind of quickly. So what is LRS and, and why do you care? Um, an LRS is, a, is another method to store linear data, to store and reference linear data that's a little bit more efficient than the XY system that, that you might be used to. Um, the, the example I like to give, give is if you're going to send someone out in the field to maintain a piece of guardrail, you give them XY coordinates, they're probably going to be pretty frustrated because it's difficult to, to map guardrail based on, based on XY. Um, it's more efficient to say that guardrail feature is on a specific route and is a specific distance from the start of the route to another specific distance representing the end of the guardrail. So we translate that to, uh, basically it's a from and a to measure along a route. Um, it's a better way to store this type of, of linear data. Uh, you can do the same thing with point, point data. Um, those are essentially called point events. Uh, so something like a signpost, instead of saying a signpost is at XY, you could say a signpost is on a route at whatever specific measure along that route that you uh, find the signpost. So uh, I'm gonna give this back to Erin and she's gonna talk to you guys about how her staff uses the LRS to do the data maintenance. Okay, so we do maintenance for system roads slightly different than how we do maintenance for non-system roads. So I'm gonna start with the system roads. We do update this data daily, but that does not mean that the data is current through every day. Um, it, it's almost impossible to do that because roads are changing all the time and we require a lot of information for us to even know when and where and why a road would change. So to give you some examples, uh, we would typically update our secondary roads based on approved petitions and municipal agreements that come out of the Board of Transportation. They meet every month. So we do maintain the approved data within a month or the month that the BOT met. Um, we update all routes based on construction projects. So whenever we can get the construction plans or as-builts, we would use that information to go in and, and update the roads. We also get highway traffic ordinances that help us update changes to the primary routes or like the interstates or the U.S. routes. So those ordinances are what give the authority to give a route number to the primary routes. Um, we do 
do some corrections. Again, I said this data has been around for a long time and we're always trying to improve it and make it better. So, and any users of the data out there, if you find errors, we'd love to hear about it so we can get them fixed. Um, we use aerial photography to help make corrections. And with all of the corrections or road updates that we make, we create something we call a DE letter, district engineer letter. And every month I send out an email to a large distribution list notifying people of all of the changes that happened to our center line that month. Um, the DE letters are also posted on our website. The URL is up here. If you want to get on the email distribution list, please let me know. Um, but that's a way to find out what has been changing in our center line uh, any given month. The non-system roads is a little bit different story. Um, this is something new to us. So again, we just added the non-system roads in 2015. So we have a brand new process. And we are dependent on the update cycle for each of those authoritative local government data owners. We're dependent on their update cycle to know when we can get their updates into our data. Um, in any case, uh, the basic process that we're going to go through is we're going to collect the data from either all 100 counties or municipalities or anyone else who's maintaining data, centerline data, outside of the DOT system data. Um, we're going to run it through the ETLs that Tim talked about so that we can um, transform what their data model looks like into this new statewide common data model. And then we'll do change detection. So we do change detection for spatial features and we do change detection for attribute features. Um, for the attributes, it's strictly street name for now. Uh, we could get into addressing at some point, but we're not going to touch that right now. Um, NCDOT is very in collaborating with anyone else who has a center line that they maintain. Because as we find changes, we want to notify you. If you find changes, we want you to notify us. Um, we all work for government. The, the closer we can work together, the better the products are going to be, um, the more efficient and, and accurate our data is going to be. So please reach out. You'll see my contact information at the end of the slides. Uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the data uses. So this kind of focuses on how NCDOT uses the data, but we suspect that um, other agencies may be using centerline data in a, a similar manner for whatever their business needs are. But for NCDOT, we use this data for reporting. We have internal reports. We have mandated reports to the Federal Highway Administration every year. We use this data for mapping. Um, Unfortunately, we still have paper map products, but we do have digital and web map products as well. Um, we tie our center line into our asset management system. So it's, it's helping with asset management and work order systems. Um, we use the data for strategic planning and helping prioritize projects, uh, transportation projects. Um, the data could be used for all sorts of, of analysis. Um, we use it for traffic analysis, travel demand modeling, um, pavement analysis, safety and crash analysis. It's kind of unlimited what you can use the data for. Um, something new that we're using the data for, we actually do have a routable network that we just created, and it's used for hauling permits. So an 18-wheeler wants to drive their load through the state of North Carolina. Um, they need to be issued a permit that tells them what roads that they're allowed to drive on, and we route them. Um, and then the last bullet here, I have a question mark by NextGen911. We have been talking with the um, North Carolina 911 board, and we're trying to figure out a way. They have a need for a statewide seamless center line, which we have, but they also need to have addressing on that center line, which we do not have. So there's more to come there. There's a lot of requirements and, and uh, planning to be figured out. Uh, there's also a lot of benefits to having this statewide seamless centerline. Uh, there's way more than, than what we're listing here. Um, but the fact that the data is centralized and in a common data model, uh, it's seamless. So there's connectivity, which helps um, if you want to map or analyze data from a larger area than, than your own local jurisdiction or, or just one county's worth of data. 
uh, you're able to do that. And also the routing wouldn't be possible without that connectivity. Um, and because it's authoritative, it's, it's official. It's an official source that, that you can let people know this is the official source for the state of North Carolina. Um, because it's edge matched, the agencies, they may be able to reduce duplication. I know a lot of jurisdictions are maintaining center lines outside of their jurisdictional boundary um, or aggregating data from other boundaries in, into one new data set. So by already having this uh, statewide center line available to them, it may help reduce some of that duplication. Um, the data is consumable by other systems through web services. So we'll show you a link of how you can get to the web services at the end. And the data model is also scalable. So Tim was mentioning uh, event data or other attributes. This data model can have new attributes or events added into it at any time. Um, an example might be if you're um, tasked with developing a sign inventory. You can easily go out and maybe take GPS points of where your signs are located, and then you just have a point location. But then if you reference it to the center line and linear referencing system, you now have an association to a route and all of the other rich information, all the other attributes that are near that location um, and, and distance measurements that can further help you uh, with any analytics that you want to do based on sign location or maintenance. So there's a bunch of ways to access the data. Um, Tim mentioned the three quarterly publication products that we've North Carolina DOTs has been putting out for quite a while now. That's not changing. You can still download those products every quarter. Um, I've listed the, the data distribution website URL here. And again, the, these slides will be published through the conference if you don't get a chance to, to write them down and you want them. The data is also published on NC1 map. And something new that we're doing is offering a daily snapshot of our data uh, through web services. So there was a presentation yesterday, if any of you saw it, um, Ryan Arthur from DOT gave a demo of a straight line diagramming tool and something that we're calling Road NC. So it's all ArcGIS Online based, web services, map services based. Uh, it's another resource that you can go online and, and view data and see what's been up to date as of that day. And I will say, if any of you have been around for a while, we have been undergoing a, a system upgrade which has caused us to freeze making edits to our data for quite some time. I'm happy to say that that freeze became unfrozen in October of 2016. We were able to make some edits. We still have a pretty big backlog, but we are able to start moving forward. Um, we're updating events as we speak now. We will continue updating line works. Uh, I think around May is when we're upgrading to 10.5, um, the ArcGIS platform for 10.5. So here's some contact information for both Tim and myself. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Um, there's also the email listed here for the NCDOT GIS Help Desk. You can always reach out to that Help Desk and it gets a ticket assigned to it. So it's tracked to make sure that you're getting a timely response. And our Help Desk people know where to route the questions to try to get you the best answer as quickly as possible. So with that, uh, are there any questions? From the presentation, or okay. Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So we have um, travel direction, and uh, you can look in the data dictionary to get exactly what you need out of it. Um, I will say a lot of that information might only exist on system roads. Um, it, it depends if the counties had it when we did the migration for non-system roads. Mm -hmm. 
So if it's a transportation improvement project, we will get a, a CAD microstation, usually drawing, um, that we can copy the line work in. And so it should have been surveyed in the field. Um, if it is a Board of Transportation approved petition or municipal agreement, um, we work with them to come within 0 0.025 miles. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's the center line of the pavement. Is that what you're asking? Right. No, it's it's pavement based. It, right of way is a, a another beast that we're. It's a challenge we're trying to face right now. I don't know actually. Um, so any road maintained by NCDOT is in the LRS. Um, when you look at it from a network perspective, it'll look the exact same. But when you look at, say, the road characteristics data, you can see there's a, a surface information. So you can see that that's an unpaved road in, in that case. Sure. Um, got you. Sure. Um, so the technicians make every effort possible using the uh, six inch resolution imagery to keep the center line in what they feel to be the center of the of the unpaved surface. Oh, wow. Where do we go? Uh, well, there's one way in the back. Appreciate it. Thank you. There's a bunch more questions. Yeah, there's a couple more. Did you have a question? Is there ongoing communication with the 9 one community to continue to update these center line files? Is there anything to know that's an initiative that's going on in numerous states? State DOTs to build that collaborative effort? Yeah, so the, the questions about ongoing communication about building out addressable center lines for the 911 or, or a shared center line. Uh, right now in North Carolina, the 911 board is tasked with um, writing a conceptual design plan and they should be coming out with an RFP in the next couple months. Um, that plan will help determine what the state is choosing to do. Um, on a separate note, through Department of Transportations, we work with the US DOT and Federal Highway Administration, and now they're jointly in charge with the Census Bureau to um, come up with addressing for the nation. And so there's other conversations going on. Um, DOTs, every DOT is required to submit an annual report with a whole bunch of data. So they keep adding more and more data that they want you to attach to it. And there is a push to try and have addressing become part of that as well. Mm -hmm. I do. I do think um, the the Nina proposed standard does have. I'm not sure it's a mandatory field, but uh, or a mandatory layer. But I do think that that is one of the recommended um, layers for addressing 
locations that don't necessarily have a physical address. Can I also respond to that? Yeah. Recently, the rail division has been working with the GIS unit and the traffic engineering branch to produce a product that will require oversized, overweight vehicles, truck drivers, to go through a process in the permitting that they will have to establish their truck route and where it encounters a grade crossing. They will have to be able to determine if they can navigate that route or not. So it will include stuff that includes bridges, where they have to navigate a bridge, um, either over or under, um, you know, weight capacity, height, vehicle restrictions, and uh, railroad crossings. So some some railroad crossings are humped in nature, and so you know they, they can have a tendency to bottom out or get stuck on railroad tracks. So it's up to the railroad. I mean, it's up to the trucking company to determine that, and they will have to uh, determine that in advance before the driver actually takes the route. But we're making a, 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 in the process of making an app available. For the trucking companies. Thank you, Larry. The nature of my suggestion is uh, next generation 911 connection. But when the trucking company doesn't care or doesn't even realize how low they're going, and now they're stuck, and here comes that truck. Yeah, the, the information that is in the stuff available on that routable uh, truck route will have the information for them to call the railroad company. Got the phone numbers in there for it. One more question. Okay. Um, for uh, some time, uh, the, the DOT GIS download site uh, does or did uh, offer uh, all system roads. I think it was a, a shape file of all the roads, including system and non system. I can't remember what it's called. It's IBS. Is that, a, is that a completely different source, the census or Tiger or some other, what is, what, what is the source of that? Is it still offered or is it superseded by your uh, new inclusion of the non-system roads? It was a, a one-time effort, I think, from 2007 that has not been updated or maintained since then. Um, when we did the migration of the county road data into this, the new state data in 2015, we did bring over addressing information. So if you're looking for something comparable, use what, what this latest one is we have now. Well, maybe I downloaded it in 2007 and I'm still using it, I guess. And it's, uh, yeah. But, but your download now includes non-system. It includes non-system and there, there is addressing information in there, but the DOT does not have a mandate to update addressing information. So again, it's kind of a, a one time unless the um, requirement that comes out from the 911 board re will require that. Yeah, grab, grab the later copy. <laughs> Okay, well, I don't see any other questions, so thank you very much. And uh, feel free to reach out to us if something else comes up down the road.